Now entering Nerdist.com. What's happening, everybody? This is the Wrestling and Padres Slamcast. Look, we have an incredibly special holiday episode for you today. But here's the thing. There's been so much going on in the world of wrestling this past week, especially in podcasting. Good Lord. Oh, my God, Dale. We thought, we, we just you and I, just you and I in studio, we thought, hey, we have a lot to talk about. Let's do that. Then we'll get to the Santa Nick. Santa Mick? Santa Nick. Saint Mick, old Saint, old Mick. Saint Mick. We'll get to that episode. Really, it's two episodes in one because why not? You guys deserve it, and we think you're going to love every single part of it. So, let's just do this. Johnny Laquasto at Jay Quasto on Twitter. Of course, follow us at Wrestling Buds. And the man to my left, you're going to hear his intro twice because you're going to hear when Mick is in the studio as well. <laughs> Uh, he's Dale Rutledge at The Walking Dale on Twitter. What up, Dale? What's going on? I mean, I can't believe the podcasting week we're having here. I mean, the internet, people like to joke about, oh, they broke the internet. No, uh, Punk and Cabana broke the internet. Oh, man, broke his silence, more importantly. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know that we would ever get this. And, you know, it's funny because the, the last 10 months, a lot of fans have been, uh, needless to say, kind of crazy about like when's he gonna talk what's going on right and the whole time we've been saying look give him his time there's always two sides to every story don't necessarily listen to wwe you just got to wait and see what happens and, yeah. and every person has a reason and i give him a lot of credit for waiting 10 months and not saying a single word because think about how we are in everyday life when we get pissed off at something what do people do they scream right away they go to facebook they go to twitter Kudos to him for staying silent for 10 months. Absolutely, and that was the one thing. When we talked to him at Comic-Con, I mean, he, he gave us a lot of time, and we yeah. talked about a lot of things. Wrestling was not one of them because he was in the middle of some litigation, and we just didn't want to approach it and have that bite him in the ass at some point. So we steered clear. Now, obviously, all of that is clean and good to go. So uh, it's good to hear what he had to say about it. And boy, did wow. he have some things to say about it. He had, And he's not done yet because as we're recording this, uh, they're recording episode two this week yep. of, of the Art of Wrestling podcast, which is just incredible. I've known Colt for years. We've done a lot of shows together. And, you know, it really says a lot about their friendship. You know, they started wrestling together, what, 17 years ago. Mm -hmm. Trials and tribulations, their careers have gone in totally separate paths. But it's kind of cool. You can always count on your buddies. And that's exactly what this. Speaking of buddies, no Chuck Rice. He's still in Houston, Texas, uh, at C Rice 17. But you'll hear him during the Mick Foley interview because Mick was in town very recently. We were lucky enough to get him in studio. So what up, Chuck? And who would have thought in in return that we would get? I don't think the WWE knew that this was coming. Nobody knew that the, the Punk interview was coming because they didn't no, even announce it. Which is smart. It's very smart. But how weird that Stone Cold with Vince would be just you know a few days later. Yeah. And they actually got to, you know, address everything that CM Punk said in a, in a very Vince McMahon kind of way. He, he was very clean, very polite, yeah. and said, you know, he'd love to have CM Punk back at some point. So it was, it was interesting to hear his side and, and not, I don't know, not have him be angry about it. I mean, you never say. I mean, trust me. I think he was probably a little pissed off. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, he said. Well, on. he said that he didn't even watch it or, or listen to it. Yeah. Rather. But he kept it very professional. I guess what, that's what I'm saying. I don't and, think he wants to listen to it. Mm -mm. That's a bad idea. When you have the temper of Vince McMahon, you don't want to listen to that podcast. No, probably not. But in the same regards, you never say never. He even said, he's like, well, you look at my relationship with Hulk Hogan. Oh, jeez. I mean, <laughs> we got back together. And then, of course, Stone Cold, you know. Oh, they, they had this almost, I mean, him and, and uh, CM Punk are very mirror image of each other in a lot of ways, as far as the way that it got handled at that particular time. They yeah. didn't like what was happening, so they left. Well, Punk definitely had different gripes. Stone Cold's mainly was about creative and storyline, from right. what I understand. Now, me, coming from a healthcare perspective, being a physical therapist, like I look at some of the things Punk said, and that's what resonated with me the most is, all right, look, I'm not a doctor, but I've worked in hospitals for years. I can see a staph infection when it's in front of me. That's the thing that concerns me. And look, there are two sides to every story. I'm not pointing fingers. But when there's a massive coloring welt on a person's body that will not go down and is only getting worse. And it's not a hickey. Right. Definitely not a hickey on the low back. That's a weird lumbar hickey if it is. <laughs> and it's only getting worse. And you just keep flooding a guy with Z-Pack or any kind of whatever band-aid you want to put on it. That's my concern. Is that what a Z-Pack is? I don't know. What it's it's an antibiotic. Is. Oh, okay. And, and antibiotics, yeah, you do take them for staph infections. I've had one before on my hip that I picked up from the gym. I'm guessing it from the gym or a Ooh. spider bite. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But this is how fast staph infections can happen. One day I woke up and my hip was sore. Two, day, two hours later, I was limping. 
Hipposaurus, that was my favorite dinosaur. Hipposaurus, yeah. they they're uh, br- they eat just greens. They eat <laughs> yes. a lot of greens. Yes. Uh, and they, infections. They run away from T Rexes. <laughs> And the next thing I know, five hours later, um, my hip was killing me. I was limping even worse. And next thing I know, it actually opened up. I had to Ew. haul ass to an urgent care. The doctor had to clean. That's how fast. I exploded? Yeah. That's uh. how fast staph infections happen. I've seen people with wound vax in the hospital. The fact that he had a staph infection for however long it was, I mean, good God, that's really, really scary. And the fact that the second doctor looked at it and said, hey, that's a staph infection. And they just got into it right there. Just, oh, <laughs> That that's my issue is like, you know, health is always the most important thing. And that's why when, you know, all the fans were pissed off about punk leaving, I knew I knew it had something to do with his health. I didn't think it was that drastic. I thought maybe it was a knee. Maybe. But, well, it was it was a lot of things. It yeah. sounds like it was his health mixed in with multiple other reasons. You know, yeah. he felt like he wasn't being used right. And, and, and it, it's a big concern. I mean, I've, I've worked so many shows over the years where I'm doing commentary, but I'm the only healthcare professional there. Most wrestling shows don't have – they don't have a trainer. They don't have a physical therapist. Right. And you, it, this ain't ballet. It's a really serious sport that these guys are in. And when injuries happen, I understand. And he even said, what would Harley Race do? Totally respect that. How cool is that? It's amazing. It's amazing. It's a good but way to live. When you have that massive welt in your lumbar and it turns out what it was – Good Lord. That, no wonder he was getting sick. No wonder he was getting temperatures in the flu because that's, staph infections will run through your whole body. Yeah. And he, and he said he got concussed basically right there at the Royal Rumble as well. Oh, uh, from Kofi? Yeah. It, yeah. Was, it was a rough run right there at the end. So I, I think he was, just, he was just trying to keep it together and he just he hit his boiling point. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, let's talk about Stone Cold and, and Vince. I mean, what did you think about that? That was a lot of straight from the hip questions on on steve austin's part i thought really eye-opening and the uh, the funny thing is man though they totally crushed our after buzz show i mean <laughs> <laughs> we well they should Bam! yeah I mean, it's fine you can listen to after buzz later yeah of course but i i i was very happy that they were doing that and and to let vince open up in that way like it felt very real i don't know if he had the questions beforehand or whatever but as far as the way that stone cold was asking him questions it felt very authentic and, and very off the cuff on both their sides. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find a more authentic person than Stone Cold Steve Austin when it comes to his podcast. I mean, yeah. he just he shoots from the hip. And you're right. I don't I don't think he knew the questions ahead of time because he really he kind of jumped all around. Yeah. And he got into the whole punk issue within what fifteen minutes. Yeah, it was pretty early. You know, and yeah. and even said like almost kind of giggling in the beginning, like so. uh how do you think the network's doing? Like, <laughs> kind of laughing because, <laughs> right. you know, there's all these rumors about them panicking about the network and stuff. But, yeah. I mean, what did you – because you, you pay attention to a lot of the numbers. I mean, mm-hmm. did you believe what he was saying as far as how happy he was with the network? Yeah, I mean, they're always going to want more subscribers, right? I mean, they did this because pay-per-view was heading down. Mm-hmm. And they wanted to find a new way to, to engage people and, and keep them as fans. I, I know they wanted to hit a million, you know, within a year. Now, we're not at a year yet, but we're also not at a million. We're at 700 and some odd thousand. Yep. They're still waiting on UK. So, I mean, that'll really be a big boon once they're able to get that going. But, you know, the longer it takes for that to happen, the the more people find ways around it or, find, you know, figure out how to uh, to live without it. So we'll we'll see. It's always about fulfilling the promise that you put out there. And unfortunately, they had set a date and then weren't able to hit yeah. it. And that always is a detriment no matter what you are, whether you're a video game or a movie or whatever. You, you get people excited, and then it kind of hurts the excitement when you don't come through. Mm. And uh, so, you know, we'll see how that pans out. But. And we love our UK listeners. I mean, we we see how passionate they are. Yeah, I mean, if you want a dedicated fan base, Oof. that is where it's at. So, I mean, I, I've already talked to, to some guys that listen to the show that are coming out to WrestleMania next year, all the way mm-hmm. on the West Coast. I mean, that's quite a trek. It's their big trip of the year, and, you know, they, they really respect the sport. Yeah. And and they listen to our show, and they're very vocal about it. So I can only imagine how bummed they were when they had that date set. They got up that morning, they're like, wait, what? Yeah. Because it was like, what, 20 minutes before or something like that? Yeah. It was like right before the launch that they pulled the rug out. It was kind of weird. Well, it's it's all about what's going on in the contracts. I, I guess they didn't have it nailed down with Sky and some of the other providers or whatever. So. Very true. But well, the network is amazing. I mean, we can all agree. I mean, nine ninety nine per month is, in my opinion, it should be more expensive. <laughs> I think the network's that good. Yeah, I mean, it's not. We don't get any kind of stipend off the network, so uh, we, we, we would talk trash if we felt like it was necessary. But I was buying the pay per views every month. You know, yeah. I wanted I wanted to keep up with the product. So sure. to me, 
it doesn't cost ten dollars a month. It costs forty dollars less than I was paying a month. <laughs> exactly. So it's fine in my court, man. I can always look up my this week in wrestling stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I get to do a lot of research, and I don't have to own you know four thousand DVDs anymore. I mean, look, I pay what seven ninety nine a month for Netflix. I watch like three movies a year. Right. You know what I mean? Yet yeah. I keep that Netflix account. No don't holds know why. barred. Was one of them. Yeah. No <laughs> holds barred was one of them. Oh, they God. should pay you for that. Oh, that's awful. Science. But yeah, no holds barred's one of them. And then the other things I watch are like the the WWE products. So I never, I don't even get my money's worth on Netflix. But the network, damn, there's so much incredible content there. Just NXT and the pay per views alone. I those are basically what I use it for. And then, NXT, like I said, I'll, yeah. watch, I'll watch old stuff when I need to. But uh, yeah, man, I it's totally one of the better things that have happened on. And they were at the forefront of that business model. Nobody else was doing that. They stole NFL stole their guys who helped launch WWE. Network heard about that to help launch the NFL Network. That's how well it went. He's a bully. Damn NFL Network. They got the money. Yeah, they, actually, they're very cheap though. I know that for a fact. <laughs> yeah, well, aren't, <laughs> I have a few buddies who work for them, and they are not happy with their salary. Oh, really? I think yeah. they're here in LA, aren't they? They have like oh, headquarters yeah. here. Uh, basically, Culver City ish, yeah. closer to the airport. I don't know. That's the most I know about football. So good job, dude. Thanks up top, a lot. up yes. top. Yeah, uh, making it happen. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, th- both podcasts were. Incredible. I mean, we we're the first ones to admit we we listen to we listen to everything. everything oh, yeah. we have time for. And like I said, I've known Cold for years, and I, his podcast is incredible because it really does. Like he says, it takes you into the life of these wrestlers. And him and Punk have been friends for so many years, and for him to be so blatantly honest for two hours and really tell you exactly what was going on. Obviously, there are two sides to every story, but it really opens your eyes. And um, Vince says never say never, but after listening to that. I don't know, man. He still wants that WrestleMania moment. He even brings it up in that conversation. He did mm. not, in his opinion, get that big headlining WrestleMania moment. I think we could see a similar McFoley type of situation where maybe he comes back in a few years and gets to do something big. We'll see. I don't know. He he's over it right now, but he loves right. wrestling. Right now, he's got to work on Thor. Right. You know, which we sh- we gotta we gotta have him back on the show and talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. And mm-hmm. and I do want to say he talks about bad fan experiences, and I've actually heard people that really didn't like Punk in person. And Punk could have very easily told me to go to hell. Like there was no reason yeah. that he had to do that interview at Comic Con. Was super nice and gave. I mean, that's a lot of time. That's probably the longest interview besides McFoley that we're about to have. Mm-hmm. That was the longest interview that I think we've ever done. And it just yeah. I had nothing but a nice experience with him. Maybe I caught him on the right day. Maybe I was just nerdy enough to get in there and and discuss. Things that he likes, I don't know. But either way, I only have positive things to say about him as exactly. far as a person goes. And every single person's experience is going to be different with yeah. whoever you might meet. And obviously, he, he gives a couple of examples about how rude people are. And you see you see Twitter. I mean, let's I be mean, honest. There's some animals on Twitter. There's some animals on YouTube. And there's people that just – they're keyboard warriors. And – People say crazy shit to us all the time. Yeah, it gets a little creepy even with us. It's like, man, come on, calm down. <laughs> We're just doing a show for free, for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, oh, oh, contest. We should. Oh about- yeah. Okay, let's do this. All right, let's guys, get this going. Finally, guess what? Guess what? We're giving you something else. <laughs> Dale, go ahead. <laughs> if you don't say mean things on Twitter, here's what we're giving you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to do a Facebook contest this time. We want to do, okay, you got to follow us on Facebook or fan us on Facebook, whatever the hell they call it. Go on there and then let us know what superstar should have their own app and mm-hmm. what would it be. Get creative. Make us laugh. It's just like the movie contest. Go on there and make us laugh and you're probably going to win. Yep. Uh, just what app would you make and what would it be called for whatever superstar you think? It could be current. It could be old school guys, whoever you want to do. And our listeners are funny. Yeah. They're so, creative. I want to see some creativity on this one. Go on Facebook. Leave it on our Facebook wall. And whoever has the best one, determined by Johnny, myself, and Chuck, uh, we will be sending you the WWE 2K15. Mm-hmm. Oh, real simple. Facebook.com slash Wrestling Buds. Wrestling B-U-D-S. You will find us. Uh, we have now achieved over 1,000 likes on Facebook. All right. How about that? There Thank you, are. everybody. Yeah, I'm giving you a round. You earned it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a fun contest. You want WWE 2K15? We're going to send it to you. Dale and I will go to the post office. We will use our own dough, our own Skrilla. We're going to send you that video game. I bought the game. Yeah, yeah. you did. You got the game. You're like, you know what? I'm just going to give it away. Yeah. It's the Christmas season. And I've got it on Xbox, so I think we might be giving away Xbox. I was going to do PlayStation, but I might exchange it for Xbox because I want to play with the winner. Otherwise, what am I doing? I'm just giving a game out. Yeah. I want to see how well you can do with this thing. I've been practicing. 
Have you been playing? I'm, oh yeah, I'm you not beat good. you beat the holy hell out of me over Thanksgiving. Yeah, but then my father in law beat me later on nice. the weekend, so that just doesn't make with any no sense. finisher. It's impossible to figure out finishers <laughs> in that damn game. You can't kick out in that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, guys, Facebook.com slash wrestling buds. You give us the superstar past or present that deserves their own app and why they should have the app and, and what the app maybe the name is. Yeah. I think I think we could get some fun stuff on there. Oh, we're going to get some hilarious stuff on there, especially with this episode going up with Mix Interview. I think we're going to get some new listeners. That's exciting. And uh, if you're listening right now for the first time, go back. Check out our other 47 episodes. Booker T is on every single week. Not this week because he's very busy right now, but he's on just about every other week. We've had just about every guest you can imagine going from Impact to WWE, um, the Indies. I mean, it, we have new a lot Japan, of guests. New Japan, Japan. Everybody. Absolutely. So we really think you're going to love our past episodes. Subscribe to this show. We guarantee you, you won't regret it, man, because we're positive. We like to do the we, – we don't, we don't like shitting on products, man. We, we all watch wrestling because we love it. We're all involved in wrestling because we love it. And, yeah, we'll give criticism when it's due, uh, Larry the Cable Guy or <laughs> – any, wh- Don't you say shit about Grumpy Cat now. <laughs> no, Grumpy Cat was adorable. <laughs> I'm on board with that. Well, hell yeah. But uh, there, were, there were a couple things on Raw that were a little odd, but you know, we don't need to uh, necessarily get into that. Well, let's talk about current stuff, though. Let's, yeah, let's, let's talk a- about what's happening here. Well, we could talk about one thing. Tables, ladders, and chairs. Yeah, baby. Oh, my. Is that going to be the main event? I... I have to think that it will be because it's TLC. It is a TLC match. Mm-hmm. It is the namesake of the pay-per-view. It should go last. But, I mean, if if I had to guess, I would say John Cena and, and Rollins would probably go last. But I don't know, man. I, I, I think that they're going to pull out all the stops for, no matter where it falls on the card, I think yeah. they'll pull out all the stops for Ambrose and Wyatt. Ambrose and Wyatt, to me... You know, Punk talked about how him and Taker stole the show at WrestleMania 28. Yep. I feel like Ambrose and Wyatt is going to steal the show at TLC. If Cena and Rollins do close out, that tells me something funky is going to happen. Oh, he's losing that number one contendership if that goes on last. That's that's my guess, anyway. Yeah, it is kind of interesting with the, with the Raw GM, the, uh, the anonymous. Uh, Damn it! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope we find out who that is sooner than later, because I don't know how many times I can sit through that... Uh, Email notification. It's already getting out of control. Yeah. So, it was yeah. happening during John Cena's promo, which mm. was so irritating to me. He slams the MacBook Pro down, and then somehow later, him and Rollins are talking. That thing is just going off. I don't know. It was a little it was a little much. Whoever the anonymous Raw GM has got some quick fingers. He he types like a mother. Yeah, he took that typing class in 10th grade. I mean, Hornswoggle's Same. fingers are short. Hey, it could be him. It could be Hornswoggle. God, please not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's going to be hard to top Ambrose and Wyatt. I mean, Seth Rollins and John Cena, I think that's going to be fantastic in the, in the tables match. Um, I mean, you know. absolutely. Rollins is is on his way up. I mean, this this is kind of his year. I mean, him and Ambrose and, and Wyatt, I mean, it's been about the new guys pretty mm-hmm. much all year. Even You could kind of even throw Brock Lesnar into that because he – was gone for so long. I mean, he kind of came in and got reinvigorated this year. I think he's had a pretty good year, we could say. Blood and urine and vomit. Pretty solid year. Yeah, a he's lot got, of that. He's got the belt and he's sitting at home. Yeah, he's doing fine. Hey, you know, they both defended it. Paul Heyman and Vince McMahon both defended it uh, via the podcast and Raw, saying that he should be a special event, and mm-hmm. that is what he is. And I had a bit of a, uh, a fit last week You're a about upset. Brock Lesnar. You're a little peeved. But if this is done well, I'm I'm going to reserve any future hate about it yes. to see where they go with it. But I am bookmarking this and coming back to upset if this ends up just being a Cena promotion and then Brock Lesnar leaves. Right. I know that's not – they can't really do anything with that if, if his contract is up, his contract is up. But please let it go somewhere with one of the newer guys. Mm-hmm. Don't just let this be another Cena Comeuppance. Yeah, I mean, you look at what The Undertaker did. The Undertaker put over Brock Lesnar. Yeah. And look at what it's done. It's just, you know, now he's a champion. Now he's, he's a, a special attraction. He's a special. Yeah. The longest, you know, uh, the longest absence for a title holder. In, <laughs> oh, that's for sure. In the modern era, I guess yeah. we could say. So you're right. I mean, he's already wrestled Cena. And granted, uh, SummerSlam was historic with the beatdown. You became a meme because of it. <laughs> That's right. It was a good year for me, too. <laughs> it was a pretty good year for old Dale Rutledge. Uh, yeah, and so if it's going to become just Lesnar Cena again, it can't. It's got to be someone, someone establishing something because of it. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Or, or if that does happen, let Rollins come in and and swoop up and 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 take what was just won or or just lost, whatever you want to, you know, however it pans out. That'd be a pretty sweet cash. I'd be I'd be fine with you. Can write it however you want to. Just let there be other minglings of the younger guys. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we actually, you know, we already have a decent amount of matches that are planned out for TLC. We got uh, yeah, we got those two we talked about. We got Kane. And Ryback in a chairs match. The big guy's hungry. <laughs> he is hungry. A lot of chairs the last few weeks. Wonder how he's speaking, doing. <laughs> speaking of Ryback, <laughs> he responded on Thanksgiving Day. That's right. That little picture he put up, huh? Look, I thought it was funny because wrestling's full of ribs. Right. He had all his little. Did action you say that figures. because he got broken ribs? Is that, that well, why he's he did that? break punk ribs? That's true. <laughs> But, I mean, he had the, all the little action figures there, and then, of course, he had the punk character laying down. Right. I mean, to me, that's just him being his character. He's addressing it without addressing it. Right. I know a lot of people were pissed. Like, we had a couple listeners tweet us, like, you believe he's doing that? I'm like, yeah, it's wrestling. What – he has to defend himself. And even in CM Punk's interview, he said, are you doing this on purpose or are you just stupid? And he said, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stupid. So, well, I, yeah, I don't know. Can you – I don't know. And that goes on the company when they said, look, he's not ready, he's green. And to Punk's credit, he's like, all right, I'll, I'll do it. How about Punk coming up with the shield? That was wow. news to me. I didn't, I didn't, uh, hadn't heard that before. Yeah. That's, if, if that's true, that's pretty dope. Yeah, it was. I mean, look, just by doing the shows that I work, I hear the guys come up with amazing ideas. Yeah. They so, should. I mean, their head's in it. And exactly. these writers are there, but they're very distracted. They're trying to fulfill so many different responsibilities mm-hmm. via Vince and Triple H and whoever is calling the different shots in different directions. Yep. They should be open to guys. I wish that more guys had Vince's ear that were as great as CM Punk at knowing how to help the business. Some of the best creative stuff comes from being in the moment. You know, yeah. like like the whole uh Damian Mizdow. Right. I don't know how much that was planned. Oh, I don't yeah, I don't think at all. I think he he hadn't been to be that particular, you know, they'd run out of Davy Crockett's yeah. So they had him be Ms. Dow, and then it just they, got over. They, oh, we lost the LeBron jersey. Now what do we do? <laughs> we got this extra Ms. outfit over here. <laughs> yeah, we got some extra black leather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's, um, yes. So anyways, uh, Ryback, I. Ryback's going to go over He's in, in character. You would, I, I oh, think, absolutely. I think him and versus Kane. I don't know. Kane's not going to win a match for a while, I feel like. Nah. Poor guy. He's just there to put guys over at this point. But I, I still love corporate Kane, by the way. Speaking of putting people over, why did the New Day have to lose already? Why why did they have to be in the tag team turmoil uh, match? I love – we're, we're pro New Day, by yeah, the way, in case you obviously. can't tell. We love – all three guys have been on our show, especially Xavier Woods. He's a very close friend of the show. And they're fantastic. They were, look great on SmackDown. Yeah, they did. Then they're in tag team turmoil, and I guess they're going to feud with the Dust Brothers. I guess so. And now Usos are – Hey, okay, so besides the tag team turmoil, I really loved the way that it worked out because they, they introduced Naomi into the feud. So they have Miz, uh, well, sorry, Jimmy upset with Miz. Mm-hmm. And I, I like the way that they're doing the storytelling there because it adds a new element. We haven't really addressed Naomi and Jimmy being together. That was surprising. You know, very much. I mean, we knew they got married, but they never really acted as a couple on stage. I mean, on, on camera. So that part is great. But... I agree with you. I don't know what happened where it got pushed to SmackDown to have New Day debut there, mm-hmm. but it wasn't a lot of fanfare. I wanted way more. Where's the choir at? Y'all uh, that- couldn't hire a choir for what one day? <laughs> That's I a don't. Good point. I thought that was weird. But uh, well, Biggie tweeted that uh, that they debuted because it was Black Friday. You know what I mean? Impressive twerking. <laughs> <laughs> know what I'm saying? Well, sure, I guess, um, but. I don't know, man. It just felt very odd because I was so hyped. I mean, they made me hyped. They've been yeah. doing these vignettes all this time, and uh, then we just get them in the middle of a tag team turmoil, and they pin one team, and then they're out. Yeah. As much as I, I like the uh, the evens and odds game they play, yeah, I dig that. And I, I and think the finisher that they did, oof. or I presume it's a finisher that they did on um, the the Dust Brothers was great. And yeah. then to have them come out and interrupt them, yes, at least they gave a reason as mm-hmm. to why they were. Pinned. Well, they have amazing chemistry. You look at the Dust Brothers, you look at the Usos, they have great chemistry because they're related, for God's sake. And yeah. then a new day, I mean, Kofi, E, and Xavier, they've all been friends, and they have amazing chemistry. You so can I tell. dig yeah. that, man. Yeah. And what? him pulling out a hanky to wipe down his oh, face. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Well, hey, man, you gotta, you sweat in that ring. I mean, but between those three teams, they could really carry the tag team division. I just hope that new day 
Really, I mean, them and the Dust Brothers, that's going to be a hell of a feud. It's going to be a little weird with the third guy on the New Day, but still, it's going to be a very, very fun feud to watch. I am interested to see, because the way that they were kind of painting this back before they kind of hit the reset button on it, it seemed like Xavier was sort of playing a manager slash wrestler role, Mm -hmm. you know, because he's the best talker of of the three, you know, really. Um, Yeah, that's definite. But I don't know, the way that they played the, the even odds game, uh, there, it seems like, will they be just randomly changing who's wrestling every time they come out? Or? New day rules, baby. Yeah, who knows? We'll see. New day rules. <laughs> uh, we got a couple of things. We don't know exactly which matches are going to be on TLC. We got uh, we got Eric Rowan and Big Show. They got something going on. I don't think that's official yet. Uh, show, well, they actually, they destroyed each other with steps. Oh, man, that bump on Rowan's oh, head man. looked like an Easter egg. Jesus. That was not good. Man, but I, he took it like a champ. That IQ bumped down from 143 to like 126. Yeah. He'll have to upstairs. look at the Rubik's Cube to do it next time. Damn. Yeah. Uh, AJ Lee and, and Nikki, is there a rematch? Is there a, a triple threat happening? What's up with Brie Bella? We still aren't really quite sure. Is she playing nice till she can get a chance to get the belt? Let's be honest. I don't know. <laughs> no idea. Why is she being so nice? I don't know. It don't make sense. But I actually, it made me realize that I much prefer her as a heel. I think both of those girls Who, are... Nick? Oh, the Bellas? Bellas, Oh, yeah. without question. Nikki, oh, yeah. I already knew that I liked her better as yeah. a heel just because, I don't know, she's just got that kind of like bitchy thing down sure. pat. But Brie, too, I think I think she's kind of more suited to play a heel role. I mean, I think just in life, any beautiful woman's better suited as a heel. Maybe that's coming from personal experience because they're all heels to me. Yeah, but... maybe. <laughs> Sorry about your luck on that. Oh, man, what are you going to do? And then I guess Rusev Swagger, the, the rematch. Part deux. Yeah. Or however you say that in Russian. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. So that, yeah, I guess poor Zeb's got his leg hurt. Um, poor Zeb. Yeah, Rusev Swag. I mean, look, I love SummerSlam. I, when, when Swagger came out, you and I were there. It was awesome. It was amazing. He didn't win mm. then. And no. then he lost, I think, a couple times total, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 he, yeah. he wouldn't tap out. Right, and right, I, right. I don't know. I just don't. To have somebody not be pinned for this long, it's not going to be a rematch from a guy he beat three months ago. Mm-hmm. That's not the guy who's going to get the pin. Right. So. We go. I guess he wins and goes. Yeah. So I, I don't know. This this feels like a, a space holder or a time filler for. I like where Swagger's at, and I never thought I would say that. But. Right. I didn't think you would either. I love Rusev. <laughs> and I, I, you know, but it just to me, I just don't. I don't think this is going to happen until we get somebody like a Daniel Bryan or a Roman Reigns, like a returning person, yeah, come well, back. And I would love Rusev. to see someone from NXT challenge him. I just don't know who that would possibly be. Yeah. I can't <laughs> wait to have some of those guys come up. I think we're getting Sami Zayn sooner than later. Mm-hmm. I'd love to get Finn Balor up there. Well, then we'll find out December 11th TakeOver. That's uh, that's what, next week? There's only, yeah, there's only a few matches that are official. They got Yeah, they got the tag team, yeah. Hideo and Finn versus The Ascension, right. which... Uh, again, I feel like we know how that's going to go. Sure. Uh, we got Sammy and Neville. Mm-hmm. Sammy says he's out of there if he the doesn't win. Yeah. yeah. And I don't. Have they announced a women's match? I, I mean, you know, it's going to. Charlotte and Sasha Banks will be involved. It makes you wonder if it'll be a triple threat with Bailey. Yeah. Will Bailey be in there? I feel like she has to be. I think so. Point. So, yeah. So and there's going to. There's got to be at least a few more. But yeah, that's going to be. It's going to be, I mean, every takeover has been fantastic. This is the third installment of it, and um, it's going to, I think this, uh, there's going to be change after this takeover. I think this might be, like you said, the goodbye to a couple people and heading up north. I hope Charlotte gets moved up, too. She would really inject some new life into the Divas division. That is for sure. Agree. And Sasha Banks is ferocious. I said this last week. I was down in Florida a few weeks ago and saw a live show. She... Doesn't matter how small she is, she kicks some ass. Man, I, I love her. I love her attitude. Yeah. I love her look. She moves well in the ring. Yep. She could go too. I just don't think that they've paved her way as as much as they have for Charlotte. Right, but she's going to she's going to do it for herself. I mean, she's young. She's like twenty twenty something, and she's got it all already. And Charlotte has been kind of going by Charlotte Flair lately. Like, there's a little seems like that's popping up more, and I feel like that could also be an indication of her moving up and, and having, you know, the recognition from her dad kind of sure. thing. I don't think she needs it, but, I mean, if she wants to go that route. Do it with Flair is a great motto. You were always home eating a ribeye. <laughs> Damn right it is. 
So uh, nothing really with Impact right now. They're moving to Destination America in early 2015. I believe the rest of the year is just going to be kind of like best of shows. Have you looked for that on your cable? I have not yet. I need to look it up because yeah. I, I hadn't heard of it before this. I know it's owned by the Discovery Group. I think so. I mean, they have a lot of different shows. They have a couple of paranormal shows. It's, it's a blue collar type channel. I mean, bottom line is we want people to have jobs. We really hope it works out. We have a lot of, I mean, Austin Aries is a very close friend of the show. Um, and Somewhere is better than nowhere, buddy. Yeah. I'll take it. Absolutely. So we wish him the best. Uh, Lucha Underground has been heating up. A lot of good stuff there. Oh, man. I love the back and forth between Dario Cueto and Conan. Uh, <laughs> Conan is such a great character. I never, I don't know, I just wouldn't have expected it, but this role for him is he's, like... He's got a Godfather thing going exactly, on. Exactly, exactly. And I love his his backstage promos or everything, obviously. But yeah. just even him talking to Puma in the in the workout area, was that last week or whatever, right. when he's doing the... The whatever the crunches. Doing the, the, those abdominals, those ab- abdabs, those obstacles. <laughs> I just I don't know. There's something about it, and the lighting's always really good. And those things. Yeah. it just it feels cinematic, and I think it really makes all the guys there look all the better. He reminds me almost of a Latino version of Mickey from Rocky in a way. Like obviously a younger version, mm. but like he's the guy. That, like, look, this is not your fight. Right, just chill. Yeah, like he's the voice of reason, but at the same time, you still don't know if he's in cahoots with Cueto. That, that's he's very shady. Yeah, I like that. The, yeah, it, it's it's great work there. Uh, Sexy Star and Evilise, really good. I love the promo Evilise cut on Sexy Star. She obviously lost, but yo, she can talk, which is cool. Yeah, it's nice to see that. And and Sexy Star wrestling with dudes and chicks. Yeah, I, yep. I think that's great. Blur that line. Uh, let's talk creepy. <laughs> we got Drago and Mel Muertes. Oof, Drago and that tongue. Yo, I don't know about all that. I don't like it. What is that? Jello? Why? What is that thing? I've never. I don't. I've never seen anything like that. I don't like it. It makes me feel uncomfortable. It's disturbing. And then Mil Muertes uh, stands for a thousand deaths. So yeah. it's like. I thought he might take Drago's mask slash head. You know, yeah, right? like when he came with that big deer thing. Yeah, I was like, like, Give me that tongue. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna grab that tongue. Like, is he going to collect masks from people? I don't know. I'm going to pile drive that tongue. <laughs> Hold on a minute, play up. I don't want to talk about the tongue anymore. <laughs> <laughs> then, of course, we got Johnny Mundo, um, who initially was uh, our pilot episode. <laughs> Which we'd never aired. Maybe we could didn't do get that a chance to air it sometime as a secret bonus episode or he'll, something. But he'll, yeah, he'll come back. He did come in and help the show out and and got us the gig here at Nerdist. So. Yep, he's the main guy. I mean, him and Prince Puma forming a friendship there. It's really cool. Puma is just incredible. But that's what I'm talking about. Ooh. Johnny Johnny Mundo. He feels like a bigger star than John Morrison to whatever re- like. The way that they've, when he had that scene in the hallway where he beats up those three dudes, and then Mm. the last dude, he punches him, and the dude rolls to open the door to the office, and he talks to the guy. Ah, like, hey, yo. Exactly. I loved every second of that, and it was just, it was done in a cheap way, but it looked really yeah. good. And it's something different. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, it's, it's it should have an entire Lucha roster. It's like, well, you know what? They're trying to cater to the American audience, too, that are also going to bring in the Luchas. And I think it's a really cool division of both. And you have guys like Johnny Mundo that have a lot of Lucha styling to their wrestling. Right. So it's not like, I mean, yeah, you have Ezekiel Jackson or Big Rick. But Who has no lucha styling. Has no lucha styling, but he's playing a bodyguard. <laughs> sure, you know? sure, sure. So I think that they're doing it all with purpose, and I don't, I don't mind having those guys. I mean, they have people like Matt Cross who they put in a mask mm-hmm. and, and made him uh, a little more lucha appropriate. So I, I think there's, there's lots of great ways to infuse the lucha style and make it its own thing. It doesn't have to be straight lucha. It is whatever they want it to be. Right. It's obviously this brainchild of, of the guys in, involved. I mean, anytime I wear a mask, I feel more lucha. How often are you wearing a mask? All the time. Oh. Different masks. Bill Clinton, uh, <laughs> E.T. <laughs> you stop? I mean, all types of cool masks, but it just makes me feel more lucha when I do it. Okay, that's great, buddy. So what do you think? Should we get to this uh, Christmas episode? It is the season. Tis the season. So... Ladies and gentlemen, it's actually a second time on the show. We only had him for a phone call last time, but we found out he was coming to L.A., the director of his film, uh, Tommy Avalone. What up, dog? He hit us up and said, hey, do you want Mick Foley in studio? We're like, yeah, we want Mick Foley in studio. He came in. We had just an incredible conversation. We talked about Christmas, the holidays, a career, life. Hey, we had old St. Mick on Raw this past Monday, so it was meant to be. The Him and Noel, hilarious. I just figured out that he named his child Noel, by the way. Like, yeah, he's that obsessed with Christmas that her name is 
Noel. Even 21 years ago, or however old. Oh, yeah. yeah exactly. He's a Christmas loving fool. <laughs> but yeah, such a fun time with Mick Foley. So we now give you our special holiday episode with Mick Foley. Enjoy. Wrestling buddies want to be your buddies. Hey, what's going on? Hey, buddy. Buddy. <laughs> It was the weeks before Christmas, and all through the house, every creature was stirring. Because there's a brand new compadre. It's all up in your eardrums. What do you think about that, guys? That was just... Uh, yeah, all right. Anyways, <laughs> what's up, guys? Merry early Christmas to you. This is the Wrestling Compadre Slamcast right here on Nerdist. Yes, we're weeks away from Christmas, but it doesn't matter because it's the holiday season. We have such a special show. We needed to give you three weeks to digest all of it before Santa comes and makes your holidays amazing. I'm going to just get right into it. Johnny LaQuazzo here at Jay Quasto, The man to my left, he's wearing a Grinch t-shirt, which is uh, it, it's not fitting because you're the f- furthest I can ever imagine. From being a Grinch. Well, the thing about it is, the Grinch had to learn the lesson about Christmas. So you used to be a Grinch, is what you're saying. Well, I grew up, grew up Jehovah's Witness, so <laughs> it has it has some similarity. Round of applause for that. <laughs> <laughs> but he learns to love, Johnny. He learns to love Christmas just like I did. How long did it take you to learn to love? Well, I wasn't allowed to celebrate Christmas until after I was 18. Oh my god! Because I left the house. <laughs> Thank God you left the house. Yeah. Hey, at least he gets a Christmas now. Oh, don't okay? give me your Jew stuff. We get it, man. <laughs> You're doing fine, all right? Anyways, the man wearing the Grinch t-shirt, he is none other than Dale Rutledge. Follow him on Twitter at the Walking Dale. I got a puppy. I got a puppy? <laughs> Bad news. Happy early holidays, man. I like that. That might be my new Christmas jingle. It should be. You should can we get... add some sleigh bell in the background? Uh, I'm not that good, but I can give it a shot. <laughs> you know, it took me like weeks to get that done. <laughs> yeah, I don't want you to go overseas again. Just add sleigh bell. I was sweating in a hotel, just like trying to make you happy. Like, oh, guy, 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 I edit this on my iMovie. I love it, Johnny. Uh, the man to my right, he is the pride of Houston, Texas, behind Booker T. Way behind Booker T, actually. <laughs> uh, find him on Twitter at CRice17. He is Chuck Rice. He's a man. So does this man. Yeah. <laughs> you cut me cut me off. <laughs> so is this uh one of the eight crazy nights for you? The fact that we're celebrating already? It's crazy, man. You know, at least I got that Adam Sandler movie too, you know, the eight crazy nights. Mm-hmm. That, that little cartoon No, it doesn't do justice, man. Okay. I, I I'm so excited to get to have a wrestling compadres Christmas episode. Right? It makes me feel a part of the holiday. As it should. <laughs> I mean, we brought you in. Even though you claim to be Jewish, I don't really see that many examples of it, but you talk about it all the time. <laughs> Down with your trousers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where that voice is coming from. We're still waiting on the special guest, but he might arrive in his sleigh any moment. But guys, since this is the Christmas episode, I have some gifts for you. They finally arrived. You uh, know, I told you weeks ago, I'm like, I got you a gift, I swear to oh, God. Oh, that's right, overseas. All right, as you know, um, I was lucky Lucky enough to, honored to perform for the troops overseas in Africa and the Middle East all through October. Oh, boy. And uh, I, I got a gift for you guys. Believe it or not, a package from Ethiopia takes a while. <laughs> I believe it, actually. I, I kind of believe that. I thought it was lost forever. Like, I packaged the box up before I left uh, Arbaminch, Ethiopia, and I didn't think it'd ever get here. I'm excited and nervous. But Why it is did. that? Uh, it's, it's not a bomb. Um, <laughs> that wasn't what I was Ethiopia guessing. Ethiopia is known as, as one of the best places for coffee oh, in the world. I can, they I can do, smell it. Yeah, they do the Ethiopian coffee well, that, ceremony. That might be your cologne. I'm not sure. It could be. <laughs> I don't wear it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you like smelling like chocolate quote, cookies. Quote, uh, Sebastian Stallone, I never use them. <laughs> <laughs> <I never. laughs> so they do this thing called the Ethiopian coffee ceremony where they literally uh, will take the beans from the tree, they grind it by hand, they roast them by hand, and then they just make the most amazing. It takes like two hours. It's incredible. And this place actually packaged some coffee up, and I got a mailed back wow. from Arbaminch, Ethiopia for Okay, you guys. that's really cool. It's, it's, oh, thanks, Johnny. It might be the best coffee you've ever had in the world. Do I have to grind it up into the two-hour process, or they've already done that? Well, you know what's funny? I was told you may have to roast them a little bit more. I okay. don't know anything about coffee. I don't know how that becomes liquid. Well, Monica, that's up to you. You know, Monica works at a coffee place. Like that's so, She is coffee obsessed. So we can ask her. We can ask her all this stuff. I should get her a bag. Well, this looks like enough to share. 
How, uh, this is a lot of coffee. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's you know. what I meant to say is thank you so much. No worries. And Thanks, uh, Johnny. when our special guest arrives, I do have a gift for him, as do you. I don't know when um, when he's going to get here, but we can only hope that. I heard someone on the roof earlier. Are you sure he's not here now? I mean, wait a minute. What? This is beautiful. Oh, holy night. Where's this? The stars are bright. Wait, wait a minute. What is happening? Oh, my God. He has arrived, ladies and gentlemen, all across the world. I don't even know what to say about this man. The music's so loud, I gotta turn it off. <laughs> it is now time for a grand introduction for our special guest in studio. He's a champion all over the world, multi time best selling author. For years, he entertained us as the hardcore legend, but now he's bringing Yuletide joy and cheer to the hearts of millions, known as the Christmas legend. Ladies and gentlemen, he is Mick Foley. Nice to be here. If, if I'd known I was getting a special introduction, I wouldn't have been blurting out random nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Done with your trousers. Or singing William Regal's original theme song. Well, it's funny. We usually yell that same stuff to him every week. So yeah, it's it not, fit right in. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's commonplace here. We can tell you how exciting it is to have you here. You have so much going on, and thanks for taking your time out to be here. Well, it's, it's great to be here. Right here. In Los Angeles, California. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> cheap pop. We love the cheap pops on the show. <laughs> yeah. uh, before we get into it, guys, let's talk about Mick's upcoming dates. December 5th, he's in St. Louis. December 6th, he is in Indiana, Santa Claus, Indiana. December 7th, he's in Bloomington, Indiana. And December 14th, he is in Hartford, Connecticut. Go to realmickfoley.com for all the show dates. I actually saw you in Nashville. Thank you, Johnny. A couple of weeks ago. And uh, just so much fun. You walked away pretty impressed, right? Of course I did. And I uh, thank you for mentioning that each time you come see me, it's a different show. Like, at a, at a certain point, I'm going to run out of exaggerations. You know, I, I'm gonna... <laughs> Will you? <laughs> <laughs> nah. Well, one of the fun things is you get out there. In this case, it was uh, in April. We'd just get on stage in, uh, in North Carolina and with some ideas. And it's almost like it's almost like wrestling. Like, uh, people ask me about Mr. Sacco, and I'm like, Mr. Sacco was just one of those things we threw yeah. out there, like, with no idea that it would stick. And so you go out there and you try out a bunch of things, and then you kind of feel what the show, not to get all metaphysical, but you get a feel for what the show wants to be. And then, mm -hmm. so by the time you've seen it, it's like stuff that I've worked on. A few years ago, I thought I owed it to the audience to give them a new show every night, like that <laughs> someone would drive a couple hundred miles and Can't hear me tell the same yeah. story. So what I was doing was never actually giving anyone the best show that I could. And I think you got a, you got a good one there in Nashville. Oh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, and I've seen you... You know, change the act because we did a show um, after SummerSlam 2013. So we're talking a year and three months later. Yeah. And the show is completely different. Like, it was amazing back then, but now it's like you have more stories, more punchlines. Like, as a comic watching it, I'm like, oh, Mick's throwing some punchlines in here now. Okay. <laughs> like, it started off with a lot of stories. Now it's like it's a whole Yeah, I'm finding thing. the places to put the punchlines in. And even there's a, a line I've been throwing out there. And I'm like, I'll give you, the, I'll give you the line, and it's not a laugh out loud funny line. And in a way, it's, it, it, <laughs> it, 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 it bombs, but it's a comfortable bombing because I'll, I'll talk about how I'm a glass half full type of guy, mm -hmm. and other people after losing their ear in a match in Munich, Germany, might be down, like right. bemoaning the fact that they will never be able to live out their dream of becoming a carpenter. <laughs> and I'll just kind of pause, and I'll actually right. see like people explaining the joke, like with the pencil and that, and then I'll go, I'll go because there'd be no place for the pencil, and it mm. gets a groan, but I like the <laughs> groan because I know I have something good coming up after that. Well, it's like for the people that don't get that joke, it's almost like you have to put the pencil there and let it fall down your ear, right? Like so they be like, oh, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a visual learner. <laughs> Uh, but, Mick, not just stand-up, though. We have a lot of stuff to talk about. So last week – I'm sorry, a few weeks ago we got contacted by the director of your film, uh, I Am Santa Claus, yes. Tommy, uh, Tommy Valerone. Aval Aval Avalone. Avalone. I know yeah. how to say it right. Yeah. Um, great guy. And he you said, hey – You your vowels and consonants mixed up there. It, the Italian names yeah. are just hard. <laughs> and he said, hey, Mick's going to be in L.A. Let's, let's make something happen. And, and we were lucky enough – me, Chuck, and Dale were all lucky enough to watch the film. And it is – even like you say on stage, it's something completely different than what you would expect. So explain mm -hmm. in yeah. your words, and you're, you obviously produced the film, Tommy directed it. Um, explain to us what I Am Santa Claus 
really yeah. is. You know, I got involved. I was just a subject. Like, I was the right. guy who gets to be the guy, you mm-hmm. know, for the, the head honcho, the big cheese for the, for the first time. And not like I d- I've done it on SmackDown or even for the troops overseas where it's obviously just a guy with a big party city wig and beard. But, like, <laughs> I'd actually be sitting in the chair as, as you know, as the head honcho. And uh, I found that, I, you know, I got involved, you know, really um, – emotionally invested with the film because it reminded me so much of wrestling. It really did. Like the guys who are far more comfortable in someone else's skin than their own, you know, mm-hmm. guys who will, you know, there's a great line in, um, in, uh, beyond the mat where Dennis stamp is on the trampoline. And he says, you never know when that phone might ring. It's been 10 years, but it might ring any day. And it's uh, like that in a sense that these guys, they're not waiting 10 years, but they're waiting <coughs> all year for mm-hmm. those six weeks that they can be that guy and whether it's my friend uh, who legally changed his name to Santa Claus showing his mm-hmm. commitment to his craft or, or Santa Bob who kind of has you know he has a, a nice outlook on things like Santa's part of his life but it's not his entire life to Santa Russell you know who, who needs to be that guy for six weeks uh, not only for his emotional security but also financially depends on it right. and uh, so it's an, and then of course Santa Jim, who's been a firestorm of controversy uh, only for his, you know. Oh, gay Santa. Yeah, yeah the gay yeah. Santa, yeah. I've, I've felt that backlash, you know. I, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I thought that was interesting because in the film he talks about how he himself hadn't really experienced a lot of problem with being a gay Santa. But, but through this film, it seems like maybe it's bringing more attention. Oh, yeah. Because I don't think there was actually a sign out that said, meet, meet the gay <laughs> Sit on gay Santa's lap. <laughs> was, but, uh, maybe at a club. <laughs> he was one of my favorite Santas oh, on the movie, He's though. He's everybody's like... favorite Santa. My daughter told me after she went and we saw the movie, just the crew and uh, – and friends, and on the way home, she's like, "Dad, no offense, like you're a really good Santa, but Santa Jim's my favorite." <laughs> and I was like, hey, "He's adorable. He's, he's my favorite too." Yeah. And, and then I was uh, uh, when I was in Nashville, I had uh, dinner with uh, Shooter Jennings' manager and his girlfriend, and she was like, "I am going to stalk Santa Jim. Just tell him." And she goes, "I love him. You okay. tell him when I get to, to Texas, I'm going <laughs> to send a picture." Beautiful young lady. It's like he's so. <laughs> Good. Yeah, he's got, it's I, like his heart showed through uh, yeah, in the yeah, film. You know, yeah. it feels very warm and very yeah. emotional. Yeah. What I really, who I really loved, and I don't know what Santa this is, the guy from New York who took the time <laughs> to talk, to sit down and talk with Swinger Santa to be like, look, I'm not going to yeah, judge you. That's, that's, <laughs> that's Santa Claus from Long Island. Yeah, for those, Long who, Island. those for those who haven't, yeah, Frank. Say, he formerly, I called him Frank one time, and he kind of shot me the same look that Sabu did when I called him Terry. Oh, uh, once, okay. Okay. one time I called Sabu. <laughs> Terry and he goes and he points to Terry Funk goes that's Terry I'm Sabu and that, I mean, this is a guy I've known for 15 years but right. I called Santa Frank one time and he and he, and he like he put me in my place quickly I was really proud of that that name and he's done he's yeah he's done so much not only for me and my family but you know around uh, Long Island and he could making his barbecue for uh, people who were put out of their houses yep. by a uh, Hurricane Sandy, and he, like you said, he does have a big mouth, but in the, but it's good because instead of just talking about the swinging Santa, he went addressed the problem, got to the you know the root of it, found out that you know it's it's just, it's not yeah. see it's, it was true you know this that was his guy's lifestyle, and uh, our my Santa decided that was his personal choice, didn't interfere with his uh, his duties as Santa, and he was cool with letting him uh, lead the. Uh, the group. This must sound like it's just. This, <laughs> hey. this is more far out there than comic book talk. Hey, we're like, getting heat. initiated. We're, yeah. we're building that heat mix for the film. By the way, I am Santa Claus Movie.com. Guys, it's out. Blu ray, DVD, iTunes. You can buy it. I am Santa Claus Movie.com. Netflix as well. Let's continue. Uh, yep. You know, I, I, I want to ask you a question about Santa Claus or the one that's Frank, just yeah. for the purpose. Yeah. You know, he, yes. there was a part Shout in there where he says, you know, Part of his changing his persona was because he found that Santa Claus was nicer than the person he right. was. Like, you knew him before he changed his name. No, he I didn't. Sent, no, you didn't. I didn't. So Tommy, the director, still calls him Frank, and I, and I still call him Santa. And uh, but, but that's like, I think I'm on day 144, the 144th consecutive day that I've worn Santa Claus-themed attire. 
and there's something about it, you know, like you see, you do, you see people smiling at you, you know, you know, even when you're bored on a plane and it's 6 a.m. and the, you know, the, the, the airplane crew is, is weary and then you're bored and you get this big smile on someone's huh. face and a, you know, a lousy day in March. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, and I think that's what the guys like about it. You know, they love being the, the real bearded dudes. You know, they mm-hmm. love the idea you can go around and, and, you know, I've been there eating with a couple of the guys. And I've had kids run up, and I've got my Sharpie out, and they're like, no, we want to eat Santa. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what – I forget which Santa said this, but in the film, he talks about, you know, riding a subway before yeah. he dyed his hair. Was that this was Santa Frank. Claus? Yeah, Frank, okay. Yeah. So he talks about nobody would really talk to him on the train right. or any of that kind of stuff, and then right. he dyed his beard and his hair, and suddenly people want to have their kids sit on his lap and talk to him on the train, and it's just a whole yeah. different vibe. Uh, Johnny, John, you can vouch for me that one of the, the key lines, not that I want to give away my entire show, but mm. one of the key lines is where I talk about going, you know, working so hard to get heat in the ring, but deep down in my heart, like, I didn't get involved in professional wrestling to be hated. Right. Like, I got involved to be accepted, you know, and that's the same way the those guys, uh, there's a part of them. Any like, entertainer. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. a comic goes up there, and, and yeah, of course, in the end of the day, he's looking for acceptance, looking for cheers from strangers to make him feel good about himself, and, and, and it, I think that's why I was attracted to the the project because I definitely felt that from these guys like they're not whole unless they're someone bigger and better than they actually are I identif- I identified with that right away and that's what's cool about the film is it gets real like when I first started watching it when Tommy sent us the, the screener I was like oh it's gonna be it's gonna be know, fun yeah, which it is yeah, yeah it is fun it's yeah. funny yeah. but it really you know it, it, it pulls the curtain back a little bit and, and like you mentioned there's so many parallels it's like these guys are indie wrestlers looking for bookings uh, and, and I was you know, you know I've, I've received a lot of negative feedback from the community the, the, Santa, like what, Santa? the Santa community okay. uh, you know some 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 really some really rough stuff most of it centered around the trailer these were people who hadn't actually seen the film but you know the trailer makes it clear that there's a gay Santa a swinging Santa and a Santa who's maybe overindulging on his birthday which also happens to be on St. St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day, Day. <laughs> and one of, and from a very real place they're worried it's gonna hurt their business, you know, hurt the image of Santa. And I wrote back, I said, listen, to this day, Mr. McMahon does not like Beyond the Mat because he thinks it takes away from people's ability to enjoy the magic. And to this day, I feel like every person who walks away from Beyond the Mat has a greater respect oh, yeah. for what the guys do in the ring. And and we were at the L.A. premiere uh, last <laughs> month. Uh, no, I'm sorry, New York premiere. And there was a couple in the elevator, and, and the woman uh, mentioned, I had a custom... <laughs> embroidered Santa vest. Usually when you think custom in wrestling, you don't think Mick Foley, but right. uh, she, she commented on the vest, and I said, uh, I, I'm in a, you know, yeah, I'm uh, in a, a, a movie about Santa as its premiere uh, tonight at 7.30. Got that, took down the address. They showed up, didn't know who I was, huh. didn't know anything about the movie, and at the end of the movie, we did the Q&A, and I said, listen, I don't mean to put anyone on the spot, but you didn't know who I was, you didn't know anything about the movie, what's your take on this? And the the, the husband said, I had no idea people loved it this much. And, yeah. you know, and I think that's what people take from it is it's not just a guy. When I hear someone go, oh, like one of those mall Santa, I'll stop them and go, do you know how much dedication it takes to be a mall Santa? Like that's – you're way up there. And the, these are guys – And know, mall are, Santas really get a lot of flack it seems. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, for the most part, I mean there are 10,000 malls it's, or 2,000 malls. And so you're going to get different uh, – Degrees of Santa's, but uh, for the for the most part, the vast majority of these guys are just really working hard for the right it, reasons. It blew my mind, like seeing that too. You know, because like you know, a lot of times in movies you see it. Like for instance, there's movies like Bad Santa where it's like portrayed as some guy. You know, they hired like a week before. And the thing know? that gets me hot about Bad Santa, <laughs> which is a very good movie, but the idea that Billy Bob Thornton is seen as like a hot commodity, like where he can work in a different city. <laughs> this, can you imagine the same thing happening with a comic or a wrestler, right. like right. sports? Every town he goes to, yeah, we'll hire him because he's got an elf. Yeah. Just by the way, he looks nothing like the real guy. And he's got the worst bedside demeanor of all time. Yeah, he's not a commodity. No, man, you know these guys, they, they really vie for these jobs. And if you're somebody who's like putting in those eight or ten hours in a mall, you're doing it because you're pretty good. Mm-hmm. So we know that you're a producer for this film. Were you involved with the casting of any of these Santas? Or? No, Tommy already had uh, his, his crew of guys. He wow. had gone to... Uh, Tommy uh, put a lot of work yeah, in Yeah, man. T- I mean, people are calling it my movie. I, I, I estimate I, I've got a couple hundred hours uh, invested in the movie, you know, travel time and editing time. I would call him up like, 
uh, you know, on a Monday when I say, all right, I'm in Brooklyn at Raw. I'm leaving at 11. I can be in Philadelphia by 1. Let's add it all night. And then Tommy <laughs> would later tell me, like, man, I have a real job in the morning. Like, yeah, what, right, am right. I, what am I supposed to say? But I love those. Like, I got, I got so involved because I think wrestling's given me the, the ability to see, like, where, the, where to cut, you know, how to tell that story. Because that's mm-hmm. uh, essentially what we do in wrestling is, is tell these stories. And I would say to Tommy, okay, I think you should cut there. And he'd say, why? And I'd say, because if you keep it rolling, he repeats the same, the same thing twice and doesn't say it as powerfully. And in, in, in one case... What am I allowed to say language-wise on uh, on the podcast? Whatever you want to say. All right. <clears throat> I mean, you guys, you probably know. I mean, you saw my show. I do an hour and 20 minutes. And you curse. almost forgot to drop the F-bomb in Nashville. <laughs> you had to sneak that one in. <laughs> I did last second, yeah. You did. So I, I try to make... Like you could have said it to the blonde lady <laughs> in the crowd. <laughs> she, yeah, she was a mess. There's always one. There's always one. I, I try to make my F-bomb like DDP's diamond cutter. Like, it could come out of nowhere. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I like to use it as my, my big finish. But you're right, in Nashville... I forgot, so I think I just randomly said it at the end of the show. Well, the crowd was so hot. I mean, you yeah. and I know you didn't even get through. You did well over an hour. You didn't even get through so much of your material yeah. because that crowd was such a knowledgeable. Like you had mentioned, the AWA they went nuts yeah. for it, which huh. you don't get at a lot of other cities. And I had the you know the personal uh, experience in Nashville, so I was able to, to, mm-hmm. to talk about that and my episode in Memphis where Robert Fuller had the colorful you know explanation of what. The wound on my head looked like <laughs> likening it to. <laughs> Let's not give that one away. That's for the live show. That's for the live show, and that's well worth waiting for. <laughs> well, the uh, the edit I suggested was when uh, Santa Jim from Fort Worth, the the gay Santa, mm-hmm. just for the idea of identifying, you know, he gives this really heartfelt speech, you know, talk about what it meant, the realization of how much it meant to be Santa. And now when I when I go watch the the movie live, which I have three times, like I resist the urge to look at the screen. I look around at people, and I see men like wiping away tears. And I know yeah. there are going to be guys out there who are going to be wiping away those tears. And then on the way home, they'll convince themselves they didn't like Jim right. because he was gay. Like I know <laughs> human nature. So I told Tommy, I said, Tommy, you should cut right there. And he said, Okay, but why? And I said, Because I want people who are watching it to know if they don't like Jim, that they're an asshole. Right. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, it was a very, I mean, Jim is just one of the, the whole many touching parts about the whole film. I mean, talk to us about your transformation to Santa Claus because it is a lot of work. I imagine you're probably getting close to bleaching. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'll have it by the time I hit uh, uh, St. Louis and uh, by the time I defend my international uh, fruitcake eating championship in Santa Claus, Indiana. That's right. I'll be bleached out, but I, what I'll actually do is I'll, I'll put a dark hair mousse to cover up the bleaching. Okay. Because I don't want to you know, I don't want to ruin the magic for kids who are, you know, for kids who are there at the the, the uh, fruit cake eating competition. I know that sounds weird. No, you're right. You're that right. shows uh, dedication. Are you uh, kidding me? And there's this crazy explanation involving Nora Jones and the magic of Christmas. That's well, hey, wait, who doesn't love Nora Jones? <laughs> I'm She's very awesome. curious now that you bring it up. I mean, <laughs> well, I did a show. I have a, 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 a well, now that I'm, I'm friends with all, all three of the girls, but Nora has a side project called Puss in Boots, and I'm very good friends with her bass player, Catherine Popper, and I agreed to be there, you know, their Santa. And I was running late because uh, my son had his choir, and I was running late because my GPS was telling me I was on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway when I clearly was not. Oh boy! And that was where I was actually dropping f bombs in my car, like the most unsanta like language possible. <laughs> so that when I walked into the show, you know, there was there, you know, there's only ten minutes left in the show, and I walked up on stage and I and I said, you know, little, you know, little greetings, and then they went into their finale, which was Silent Night, and I'm like. I see that microphone, I see Nora Jones singing, and I'm like saying to myself, if you don't go up there and start singing with her as Santa, you will regret it for the rest of right. your life. So from my <laughs> perspective, it was like this this great moment, and I didn't even know until Puss in Boots put out their album and they were on tour, and then she did this interview in the green room at Jimmy Fallon, where somebody asked her if I was at the show, and it was all they said was, was Mick Foley there? And she all she had said, no, he wasn't there. And she goes, no, he wasn't there that, that night, but he was at one of our shows last month. And she went on to talk about that night in December from her perspective. And it was like I'd never thought of it from someone else's perspective. She goes, I don't know how to describe it because it was just surreal. He looked so real. It was mm-hmm. like the real Chris Kringle had just walked in. And then she said, stopped and said, 
Mick is Santa Claus. Yes. And I thought, <clears throat> that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's up there with the nicest things anyone's ever said to me, you know, about being a wrestler or a writer or, or any of the work I've done. And it's like that magic, you know, that, uh, you know, in both wrestling and in deal- being Santa, you're, you're trying to suspend disbelief. Mm-hmm. People think Santa's about the kids, but it's really about bringing the adults back to a time when they felt their best. And so you have those moments where you're good enough and everything's like in the, in that moment in the film, when I, when, you know, when, when my son, I don't want to, but there, there is a very happy moment. At, oh at the God, it's adorable. And when we're doing the, uh, uh, director's cut with the, uh, uh, uh with the, uh, alternate commentary track, you know, uh, Tommy and our other producer, Derek, were saying, your face looks like it hurts. You are smiling Aww. so much. Because, you know, Santa had brought me back to that moment. Like, right. when I was, this is like the best moment for yeah. me as a dad. And all the kids are there, too. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And even my son, Dewey, you know, he's 22 now, and he was uh, 20, 20, almost 21 at the time. Uh, he was, he didn't tell me, but my, my daughter, Noel, told me after the fact, he goes, Early in the day, Dewey was saying, this is the dumbest thing Dad's ever done. <laughs> and then when it came through, he went up to me after his dad. That was really good. Right. That was really good. Like, it was something that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll treasure for a lifetime. And so now, now when I put on the suit, now the bar is set that high, and that's the type of experiences I will try to give people. Like, when I take what I've learned in wrestling, you know, in meeting so many people over the years, and you realize that the difference between someone waiting on a, online for three hours and thinking it was a complete waste of time and waiting for three hours and thinking it was one of the best moments of their life is is really just looking someone in the eye and taking the time to, to make them feel <clears throat> like they're the most important person in the world. So, And, and that's what I think is <clears throat> amazing about you doing this is, you know, you're a public figure, you are a celebrity, and so for you to bring the whole Santa Claus life I don't want to say you're breathing new life into it, but you really are. And you learned a lot from, I don't know what Santa this was, but he has the bachelor's degree in Santa Clausology. <laughs> I saw that. He was, um, he, when you yeah. watch the film, guys, and you hear him speak and you hear him laugh, you're going to be like, oh, my God. Well, yeah, that's uh, Santa in uh, Chicago. And I will tell you this. And I told Roddy Piper gets this amazing pop. I've seen, like I said, I've seen, seen the movie three times. In, uh, in front of live audiences. Roddy, all three times, he gets an amazing pop when I say, yeah, Roddy, I went to Santa's house. And Roddy arches his eyebrow. He looks suspiciously like Tom Arnold in that scene, too. <laughs> yeah. He just arches his eyebrow, and he gets a big laugh. And then I show him the picture, and then Roddy goes, you went to Santa's house? Uh-huh. <laughs> and then I told him, I said, Roddy, I swear, you know, I was there for 10 minutes. I went from thinking... All right, this is kind of foolish. She's addressing me as Michael Francis Foley. I've known you since you're a little boy, and I remember when I brought you talking football and you were seven. I was like, okay, I'll play along. Hey, Santa, how are you? And within 10 minutes, after his daughter brings me this huge, oversized red mug of cocoa, you know, and I'm listening to him talk, I find myself thinking, like, can he really hit 350 million homes in a single night? You know, like, is this really the guy? And I think when it's done right, you know, it's like it's like wrestling. You know what you're paying for. Yep. You know what it is. Hopefully you appreciate it for what it is instead of knocking it for what it's not. But when it's done really well, you get caught up. And uh, and uh, that's, that's you know, that's what I try to do uh, when I have a suit. And that's certainly what uh, Santa Dana in Chicago did for me. Yeah, he was a realistic looking dude for sure. What was the, do you think, was the most important tip he gave you? Because I know he was listing off oh, all the, the tips most important. About... And now, as we speak, I do have my own bachelor's degree in Santa Clausology. I, oh, so what's uh, your most you, important you tip? Yeah. Congratulations. Well, I went to... Uh, Where's your cap and prof- gown? <laughs> <laughs> I went to the uh, International University of Santa Claus. It's a traveling school. Uh, yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. so the most important tip, honestly... Both hands visible at all mm-hmm. times. Mm. So if there's one child, you know, obviously that hand goes around the shoulder or the waist. Two children, you know, but if they're you, then around both shoulders. But if there's more than two, then you have to make the choice. Usually, you, you're gonna end up with either one or both your hands on your lap with the white gloves, so mm. that uh, you know you're beyond reproach. Is it mm. true that you are also now an official recording artist? <laughs> Tell us about that. I heard you mention it last week. Well, I'm on a record. Uh, right. I'm, I'm telling a, I'm telling you, a story. You dropped a song, Nick. Uh, I dropped, I dropped a seven inch. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> seven inch. Yeah, it's talking about a song, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's talking about a song. Yeah, uh, yeah. My son Huey uh, wrote, a, wrote a story called uh, 
Crazy Christmas and uh, and uh, uh, Shooter Jennings, son of the legendary Waylon Jennings, mm-hmm. and one of my favorite musicians in his own right. It was like, dude, you got anything we could work on together? I was like, I'm not a musician, you know. He goes, well, you know, I'm, I'm like, they, he's a real out of the box thinker. And I said, well, my son wrote a story for Santa, like this great story. I would wake up. Uh, we'd be on vacation. He would like have his, you know, arm over the paper so I couldn't see it. And he'd be writing away. And he'd go, Dad, how long was your book? Talking about a most miserable Christmas. I'd say I was about two thousand words. So he's like, you know, it's just hell bent on trying to write more than two thousand words. <laughs> All right. And when he finally, and we came out with the acknowledgments, the acknowledgments was read. No one helped me on this. I wrote four thousand <laughs> words by myself, and then I took that. 4,000 words and trimmed it without his knowledge to 2,000 words. And it, it, it took him a couple days to digest the fact that someone had effed with his, <laughs> his vision. <laughs> and after that, he was really cool with... Uh, and how old is he? Uh, he was 11 now. He was Ooh. 9 when he wrote it. But we went into a recording mm-hmm. studio. He did his lines. I, I, I narrated the thing. And it was like one of those great bonding moments, you know, mm-hmm. where luckily... Uh, somebody took some pictures um, while he was recording, while I was doing it, and it was like, wow, we really did it. And he'll sometimes go, but Dad, it's just a little, bo-. you know, he'll try to, he'll try to, you know, belittle his own project. I go, Huey, I'm telling you, like, when I was handed that first copy of the book, and this, we self-published it, and it was in Santa Claus, Indiana, that the public, publishing house was, uh, the guy gave me the copy, I said, I felt every bit as proud when I held that first copy of my book as I did when I held my my memoir. And so you guys know if when you're performing, right? And you say, mm-hmm. like, well, the, the, the little <clears throat> studio down here holds 140 people, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, 140 is a great crowd, you know? And, like, yeah. 140, you know, and other wrestlers would tell me the same thing when they come up, like, to do uh, – Guest guest spots on my uh, on my shows, and it was, it was a surprise. And they get that reaction, and they'll say, <laughs> you know, like. 140 or 200 sounds an awful lot like 10,000. If it's in know, it, yeah. if, if the room is intimate, <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. you get that. Uh, there's a great line that Hacksaw Jim and, Jim Duggan had uh, when asked by his fellow wrestlers what it was like to wrestle in front of 93,000 fans at WrestleMania three, Pontiac Silverdome. And uh, he came back. He was one of the first matches, and the guys, you know, they were all in awe. No one had ever wrestled in front of a crowd that size. And he said, what was that like, Jim? And he goes, brother. I wasn't wearing my glasses, but those first three rows look good. <laughs> <laughs> and really, once you take away that 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 initial pop, and 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 you know, to be fair to to Raw and WWE, when I was out there a couple of weeks ago, it was really cool to look around and see all those people. Yeah. But really, what it comes down to is trying to make a connection with the people you can see. Yeah. Which is going to be a few hundred, whether there's twenty thousand or uh, or two hundred. Well, even as an audience member, I think I mean that's uh, one of the tough things about. Wrestling. WrestleMania, having it in those big stadiums, yeah. is that a crowd has to all get behind something and to convince 70,000 people as opposed to 10,000 yeah, people yeah. that we need to yeah. chant this person's name. And there's always a delayed reaction. In yeah. a big, like, remember at WrestleMania this year, there was always a delayed reaction because it took 75,000 people. <laughs> it can come yeah. in waves, really. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, WrestleMania is like a community experience. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's great to be part of it. You're looking at those huge screens. Uh, and, you, yeah, that's why it's. Really, I know we're shifting gears a little bit. That's why Which our fans love that. We love <laughs> j- just jumping around. It was nice to see that the gears did fall into place at just the right time last year. Mm-hmm. And uh, hopefully, WWE will be able to pull off something like that, you know, where fans all get behind something. So I was able to sit out there with my kids. You know, I did the, uh, I did the thing with Booker, right. you know, where I did the, uh, the pre and post show. Mm-hmm. And so they came down and we caught the last two matches. Uh, we got, you know, we saw the Undertaker streak end, and then we saw. The last two matches after that. So, yeah, definitely a very cool community experience and a completely different experience from going, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, seeing seeing one of my shows. I I don't call them small audiences. They are intimate evenings. Intimate the best. An intimate evening (laughs) with Nick Foley. Speaking of which, do you have a favorite WrestleMania that really stands out most for you? For me, it was 22. You know, for me, it was 22 because... uh, um, and this this is something I'll say occasionally in my show. You know, I'll point to the fact that it wasn't until after I retired the first time. <laughs> the, the real, <laughs> gotta make that clear. It was the first time, the, the 2000 retirement. When I retired in 2000, there wasn't a lot of talk about WrestleMania moments. Right. Like there was no <clears throat> pressure on a guy to have had that defining WrestleMania moment to be considered some kind of legend. 
And it was only like a few years after that that really, you know, Shawn Michaels, you know, started becoming known as Mr. WrestleMania. Right. The guys mm-hmm. started talking. And WrestleMania itself took on like a larger than life feeling, you know. But it now is no longer a day or just a weekend. Now is WrestleMania week mm-hmm. with all the events. I mean, they're filling huge arenas for the. Uh, um, the Hall of Fame induction, and like I could kind of feel the whispering, you know, like almost felt like I was being put in. He never had a magic WrestleMania moment, <laughs> and I was like, hey, hey, you know, with all due respect to Shawn Michaels and being Mister WrestleMania, no one is better represented on that three disc in your house DVD <laughs> retrospective than me. That's right. But uh, I did feel a lot of pressure to come through at WrestleMania 22, and fortunately, you know, I had a guy in Edge. Oh God! I mean, you know, the perfect guy to do it with, and uh, you know, we did. We did come through. So. And that, that leads to another question. You know, you and Edge, magic chemistry. And you've had magic chemistry with so many guys over the years, whether it be, you know, Terry Funk or, God, The Rock or Edge. Is there anyone that maybe that you've worked with that, that you don't think necessarily uh, is known to the masses or, or that is talked about that you thought you just had amazing chemistry with? Oh, man, let me think about that. Maybe a couple you know, guys. That's a good question. Because you've worked that's a good God, question. so many different organizations. Yeah, I was, I was fortunate that when, you know, that was one th- thing I did have going for me is that uh, my character kind of blended well with just about it, anyone. You know, mm-hmm. I could find something in those other characters, and then they would find a way to mix in with my style. And it usually, I, I, I can't recall, I mean, and I'm, I'm, I don't, I, there were a couple that were disappointments to me because I thought I could. You know, bring you know, that guy up to that to that next level, and it didn't happen. Not because the guy wasn't good, because the chemistry wasn't there. But mm-hmm. I'm kind of loath to talk about it because I don't want to put anybody right. down. You but know? you're such a. Like, I think part of the reason why your chemistry is always so natural, people. You're such a good seller, and you know, a lot of guys now you don't see a whole lot of selling. But for someone like you, were just you. It didn't matter who you're in the ring with, what character you were playing. You always sold and made it people believe. Well, well you were at the the Nashville show, and I was that was my first full time territory. And mm-hmm. so when I was, you know, everyone has their inevitable turn. You know, I was a natural heel, but everyone turns. That was my first territory. And you take a guy, very unlikely looking, you know. I mean, I, I performed much uglier than I actually was. You know, I, <laughs> I was actually billed as the world's ugliest wrestler and believed in it to the point where other people believed I looked that bad, too. And it really wasn't until 2001 when I was on the Today Show and I was watching it back on VHS tape. I looked at it like, I'm not really a bad-looking guy. Ah, there you go. <laughs> but because I, I look kind of offbeat, you know, it, and it, I'd be a relatively tough person to feel sympathetic for. Like, I had to, like, really feel the matches, you know, and almost, like, look out to the people for help, you know. Like, and then when I talk about suspending disbelief mm-hmm. as Santa, the same thing becomes true when you're a wrestler, when it feels real to you. It helps when you have somebody really good out there, you know, with you. But when it feels real, so the people can almost feel your pain, then it becomes easy to suspend disbelief. And uh, people all are, for all intents and purposes, watching the real thing while you're out there. Absolutely. So if there was a triple threat match Ooh. of Mick Foley <laughs> versus Dude Love yeah. versus uh, Cactus Jack, yeah. who, who do you D- think dude, would come out the winner there? Dude, dude doesn't get touched. He, uh, he, he hides under the ring. Uh, <laughs> he dances under the ring. Mankind and Cactus Jack do horrible things to each other. And, uh, <laughs> and then dude comes in for the pinfall. Nice. <laughs> All right. I can see that going down, actually. That's how it would work. It's funny no. because... Once in a while, I will mention the three faces of Foley. I think I did this in Nashville, and I'll say, you know, no matter which face of Foley was your favorite, whether it was Dude Love, and it's interesting because depending on what part of the country I'm in, that will get varying reactions. And I think in Nashville, like three people clapped. And there's a guy dressed like Dude Love in <laughs> the crowd. Not, and he did not clap. <laughs> I even said, you're dressed like Dude Love, and you're not clapping. Say, How dare you put Dude Love down? <laughs> yeah. But it's funny that it, you know I was this guy, and uh, you know. He, Brought a lot of joy to people as a dude, but over time, yeah, he's not the guy that people wanted want to remember me as. And I think a lot of people <laughs> know this famous line, but it, it, you feel free to do this for us. Uh, when you brought got brought into WWE, yeah. There's a famous line, I believe, from Vince McMahon when he finally begrudgingly <laughs> agreed to bring you on. What did he say? All right, here it is. Imagine we're at a booking meeting, okay? Here we go. And uh, you're Br- Bruce Pritchard uh, to, to my right and Mr. McMahon, right? And just say uh, John Laurinaitis wasn't there, but you can be John Laurinaitis at that time. <laughs> oh, Jim, you can be Jim Ross because oh. it was Jim Ross who go. came in as head of town relations and began a very steady campaign on my behalf. 
Mr. McMahon, time after time, said he wasn't interested. And finally, according to Bruce Pritchard, like we're almost word for word, he told me a few months ago in Galveston, Texas, guy, I'm going I'm to slam my hand down. I'm going to become Mr. McMahon, right? I'm going to channel Mr. McMahon. I love so. this. Yes. All right, damn it. I'll bring him in. But I'm covering up his face. <laughs> oh, man. And you know that's totally what he said, probably. And, and God bless Jim Ross, because he was right. Uh, he, he was right. And in retrospect, if I'd come in as Cactus Jack, I probably would have had a good run. But I would have had nowhere to go after that. Mm. And to Vince's credit, like he found over time that, wait a second, this guy has a real life story that's more interesting than yeah. this story we created for mankind. And, and it was Vince who was like... Just he was like, wait a second, Mick was this guy. He created a character like mm -hmm. as dude love. He wanted me to become that guy, and he let me, you know, become Cactus Jack. And really, he's the guy responsible for the three faces of Foley. So now that I've kissed up to him enough, right. let me restate for the record that for those of you looking for some deep hidden psychological meaning behind the mankind mask. There was none. <laughs> <laughs> Just one man's quest. Cover up another man's up face. face. <laughs> <laughs> and for all the wrestling fans out there, which there are many of you listening, Mick does get into some characters in the live show, so you will love it. I'm not going to give anything else away, but he does get into some characters. Yeah, and I, and I, alter, and I, I alter the different things I do, but uh, on certain nights I go, listen, no shame, you guys out there. No shame in getting goosebumps or shedding a tear. Yep. But I'm going to put my head down. When I come back up and look at you, I will have metamorphosized into 1997 mankind. And you feel this like, <gasps> and you also get this <laughs> distinct feeling that, you know, that people are realizing the show is much better than they than they thought. I guess that way it's kind of yeah. like the Santa movie. Like, <clears throat> like yeah, okay, Mick's going to tell us some funny stories. But I do, I try to do on the stage what I try to do in the ring and I think in a sense the movie does the same thing is like you leave a piece of yourself out there mm -hmm. you know and that's why when you do get people who are really rough on whether it's your match or your movie or or your or your show I mean it does it does hurt because you're personally putting yourself you're not doing a character right. you're putting yourself out there and so you know it's easy to take shots you know whether whether it's a movie a show or a match and uh, if you're if you're someone who puts a lot of yourself into those things, it can, uh, can, it can leave, a, leave a psychological scar. And, and you mentioned them. Oh, go ahead, Chuck. You know, I, I just want to ask you, you know, everything that you've done, you've been very successful at. Like, Not every, no. Well, well, you, for the you most get part. The sales figures on my novels? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but you know, like, you, you, you said you want to be a wrestler, you accomplished that. Yeah. You wanted to be a writer, you've accomplished that. You wanted to make this movie, you've accomplished that. The comedy, you've done that. What is the next thing that Mick Foley wants to accomplish? There you go. Gay porn. <laughs> Not just, the answer no, I was no, expecting. We, we learned yeah. all about polar bears, no. so there might be a <laughs> big field I mean, for you there. Mick, we know you have a big fan base, uh, so anything's possible. I know. Nobody, no, no, nobody wants to even visualize that. You know, I, There was a reason why my career you know, took off after I started. The more I clothed myself, the better I did. You know? <laughs> yeah. I had the Tarzan singlet in 86, so that wasn't right, enough. Right. So I went with the butcher singlet, you know, through through ninety, and it wasn't until I put the shirt on in ninety one and dog on it wasn't until like ninety nine where I was covered literally from head to toe. Who's a mask and flannel yeah. in brown? <laughs> and he had the sock on his hand in brown, which is flattering. Yeah, brown was very flattering. flattering. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I make it very clear that is that is a joke. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> I don't know, man. I, f I feel like I've found some. I love, you know, I love doing. I love doing the stuff I I, uh, I have been uh, working on. Whether it's being Santa, the one man show. I would love to do, you know, more movie. I did a movie role with um, uh, Riley Keough, who is uh, Elvis Presley's uh, granddaughter. Right, you mentioned that. That yeah. was that was pretty cool. And uh, and and I did a, a, another small movie role with Jennifer Bean Blanc. And uh, she does, you know, um, uh, you know, fairly low budget horror films. And the only reason Jennifer and I wanted to work together, she literally helped me when I was lost in New York City and couldn't find the Artie Lang show. Oh wow! This was like following all those head injuries, and she had no idea who I was. Just came up with this guy. It was a big party, you know, yeah. people getting out. They're asking for pictures and and, oh and and photos. And I was like, "Do you know where?" And it was like, "Yeah, no, I got my picture. Let me take off." And she came up. And she's like, 
can I help you? And right. I said, I have no idea where I'm going, you know, and she literally walked me to the door. So I did that movie called Elevator Man, and I really enjoyed it. And I'm hoping that, you know, off the uh, – on the tide of uh, I Am Santa Claus that some, you know, director will look at me as a potential guy. And I had a shot. I don't know if you heard about the new girl offer. No. Well, you uh, mentioned it in, in your live show. Yeah. I love that and show. This is like, I love it too. <laughs> And I love Jess, you know, I love Zoe. And so when I got the offer to be uh, Santa, I mean, to audition. But I'm, yeah, but the only things I ever usually get asked to audition for are roles as myself. Yourself, yeah. Or as like a bouncer well, or a bartender. Well, ba- hold up, back up a second. Uh, you have to audition to play the role of yourself. They don't just well, no, say, no, no, hey, no, Mick no, Foley, no, you no, want to play me? No, no, I usually get that role, by the way. <laughs> I hope so. Nine out of ten times. <laughs> but in this case, it was a Santa role. Uh, but I'm guessing somebody there, whether it was Zoe, who does know, because she retweeted my Foley's Elf Week uh, six months ago, which is really cool, which was part of the 365-day challenge to where Santa Claus themed attire, and I loved. I mean, I, I was like, "Oh man!" And here it is, me in New Girl, in a scene with Zoe, and Santa's portrayed as a scumbag. You can't do that. Uh, can't do can't it. Can't do it. Uh, and now I don't have any problem with an actor doing that role. Sure, any problem. But Billy you know, Bob when, Thornton, of course. Uh, yeah, Billy Bob <laughs> Thornton, or even the Santa and Harold and Kumar, uh, you know, who was smoking the, you oh, know, right. yeah, smoking yeah. the bong on the way up in the sky. It's like, yeah, that's you know, that, that's that's funny. But I like I in, I intend to be that guy, you know, with with, with infants in my arms. You're putting Santa over, years. man. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. And so my hope is, and if she's out there listening, I, I hope she uh, hope she makes a notation of this that next year when they write a role. They can uh, come up with something, uh, you know, a little nicer for Santa. And then there's a story within the story. Yeah. So, and I think people enjoy that. So if you're out there, Zoe, I would love to do it. Oh, she listens. So she yeah. She plays Santa. She, she loves She listens us every week. <laughs> she loves the show. Speaking of putting people over, I did want to ask. So we just had Survivor Series. Yes. We have Team Authority, Team Cena. Yes. If WWE came calling for a Team Foley... <laughs> Who are some guys Ooh, that you would right. put on uh, Team Foley? By the way, can I uh, can can I uh, talk about this rumor <laughs> surrounding a uh, Foley uh, GM role? Yes, oh, please. yeah. Uh, oh, the rumor right. exists I only because it. I created it. All right, I, nice. <laughs> and I, all I did was write Foley for GM. I put it on a Facebook post, and it was like a fairly short post. I just said. I was asked a few months ago if I, you know, what I would say if WWE asked me to become a GM, and I said I don't think I'll be asked, and I don't think I would do it if I was. But after appearing on Raw, like I've changed my tune. I'm now I feel like I might be asked, and I, well, I'd probably do it if I was. As far as I know, that's all there is to it. Right. Like, that's all there is to it. I don't think anybody is, you know, I don't know if anyone's. I'd like to think they've thought about it. What if they asked you to be the GM full time as Santa? Oh. That'd be something. Santa Claus all year round. Oh, uh, might you know? Might wear some of the magic might uh, wear thin though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they have that Slam City. They have the Finisher guy in the Slam City cartoons. He wears a mask. Maybe they'll ask you to come yeah. back and be that. I'm <laughs> Foley. <laughs> damn it! I, I'm curious to know if if you would ever be interested in working with WWE in a role down in NXT in some capacity. Man, uh, you know, um, my pro I can't actually get in the ring. You know, right. uh, I mean, I would love to, and I and I did. It's my fault. I, I kind of bailed out because. Uh, uh, WWE asked me to go down to the Performance Center uh, last May, and so I booked some dates in Florida while I was down there, forgetting just how big a state Florida was. <laughs> right. And I literally would have been like driving from Jacksonville to Orlando oh, to, pull, to Fort Lauderdale, oh. back to Orlando, yeah. and then to, to West Pus. So I was like uh, 10 hours a day of traveling, so I had to bail out. But I should go back there because, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I, guys, it's, you know, these opinions, guys, when they're down there, they should be like a sponge, you know, soaking up everything they can get and then kind of deciphering what works for them and, you know, and uh, eliminating the rest. And, yeah, I think I, I think I got a value. I've got a an opinion, mm-hmm. a valuable opinion, but it's only one opinion, but one that uh, a lot of guys could learn from. I, mean, I think that would almost be like Santa coming, really. <laughs> Going to NXT <laughs> as Mick Foley, I think they would really appreciate that. So speaking of Santa, so earlier in the show, I gave Chuck and Dale their gifts. Um, I want to add one for you. I think Dale does as well. Um, I know you've done a lot of uh, shows and appearances for the military over the yeah, years yeah. for Wounded Warriors. Well, um, I work pretty closely with Wounded Warrior Project. I've gotten really close with them, and they're awesome, so that I, I got a lot of cool swag. So this is a Wounded Warrior Project uh, bracelet, and there's seven attributes they put on their bracelets. This one says courage. 
I mean, who has shown more courage in their career than you, sir? Well, thank you so very that much. I appreciate for you. that. Merry Christmas to I, you. I, okay. You know what? I have a Wounded Warrior story for you. Please. Um, talk about my shows. Uh, I went to a uh, Wounded Warriors benefit at uh, the Broadway uh, Comedy Club in New York City. Mm-hmm. And they invited me with the Warriors. They knew I'd done a lot of stuff with them in the USO. And I just mentioned to the guy, I said, you know, I used to do comedy. This is going back like four years ago. I said, I used to do comedy, so if they want me to do a set, you know, I'd be glad to do it. But they never said yes or no. And so I sat there at the front table, and I watched Amy Schumer, like, right before she hit a bag. And then a parade, you know, no one shows up in New York, on, you know, on a showcase night unless they're good. And they were all up there with their eight to ten minutes of really carefully honed material. And then Judah goes, Judah Friedlander, oh, yeah. one of the best in the business, goes up there, and he kills for, like, 15. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden they said, and now we have a special guest. You know, you know him from WWE, ladies and Mick Foley. And I got up there and proceeded to bomb. Oh, God. <laughs> Bombed to the oh, no. point where I just said on stage, I said, if I was in a pool, I would ask for a life preserver because I'm drowning up here. <laughs> and I got off that stage. It was like one of the worst. I can't even compare it to a match gone bad because at least you can go out there the next night, you know, and then try to redeem yourself. But this was like the worst so bad. I swore I would never go up there again. And if it hadn't been for Judah Friedlander, I don't think I ever would have stepped foot on stage, maybe not even inside a club, because he was there and he was like, dude, it's not as bad as you thought. I go, dude, it was awful. He goes, dude, I'm telling you. He goes, now listen, ordinarily, if someone goes four straight minutes without a single laugh, they're done. He said, but they're actually listening to you. You're a storyteller. He goes, don't get me wrong, dude. You have to find ways of making this funny. (laughs) <laughs> and then he like gave me like the twenty minute pep talk, and I went home, and at least I was like, "All right, maybe you know, maybe, maybe." But I swear, if it hadn't been for Judah there, like you know, talking me off that ledge, hmm. I would have, I would have never done it again. So thank you to the Wounded Warriors and Judah Friedlander. Will you have redeemed yourself and then someday? Thank oh, you. What do you oh, got yeah. for so, Santa? This this might give you a different kind of court, <laughs> but this is uh, hey present for you. What do we have here? <laughs> Hang on a second. This is in case being Santa gets a little rough uh, some days. Let me see. It's, it's a little pint bottle. <laughs> what the hell, Dale? <laughs> a, a Santa flask? Oh, man. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? You never me? know when you might need some backup. It's Santa's helper. Uh, it reminds <laughs> me of my, my favorite Christmas episode of all, all time is Art Carney as the uh, down in his luck department store <laughs> Santa in Night of the Meek, the uh, Twilight Zone. Christmas oh, wow. Show. Okay. He falls off his throne and the kid goes, look, Mom, Santa's loaded. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great it's a great episode. Talk about redemption. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will not use this on the job, but I may uh, I think it could be after hours. Take kinda... occasionally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a random occasional you know, one or two drink guy. <laughs> of course. On the road. Well, now amazing. you'll think of uh, you'll think of us when <laughs> you uh, <laughs> when you toss one back. So let's go over these dates again. December fifth, St. Louis. December sixth, Santa Claus, Indiana. December seventh, Bloomington, Indiana. December fourteenth, Hartford, Connecticut. RealMickFoley.com. And guys, I am Santa Claus Movie. Dot com. Obviously, uh, Mick Foley is on Twitter. Uh, the director, uh, Tommy Avalone's on Twitter. Just A-V-A-L-L-O-N-E. Give him a follow. He's a great dude. Puts so much work into this film. And I do want to say, too, besides just learning about the, the lifestyle of a, a, a Santa movie. Claus, cinematography oh, alone. Yeah. So, well, I mean, just, it's a beautiful looking movie. Great. The way it's put together is mm-hmm. just, it's a great story. Yeah, the mu- uh, the, the original you know the original music, uh, the, the you know the new takes you know, on the public domain songs. Obviously, we're allowed to use the tunes, but not the we can't use Chet Atkins, Jolly sure, right. Old Saint Nicholas. They did a great job, and uh, Toothpick, who wrote uh, songs, uh, Tommy first discovered him in Morgan Spurlock's Super Size Me, wrote original you know music for uh-huh. uh, for the movie, which is really cool. You know, sure. San- Santa got drunk last night. Is it was not a song until we made That's it. A great. Song. I, I was like, where did that come from? I know, yeah. I was- Santa, Santa Boy while while Santa Jim is posing. Yeah, that's that's an original <laughs> tune. They sound like uh, classics. Yeah. Oh today. yeah, yeah. It was done well. And the Santa's barbecue song. If you don't like barbecue, you probably don't like Santa Claus. <laughs> But yeah. I know that you do, because Santa's got it. And you know, they, you know, people walk out of that, and they're actually singing it. And mm-hmm. it was this guy, Toothpick, with these original tunes. So. Are those going to be available for people to download uh, anyway? I don't know. Maybe so. But I appreciate it from, uh, you know, from a filmmaker's perspective. And you and I were talking earlier about uh, Kevin Smith uh, you know, talking to me and Tommy after seeing the film. And it's like, that's so rewarding on another level, above and beyond people who just who enjoy it or take something away from it. 
uh, emotionally of people who can appreciate all the hard work that went yep. into actually making it. So thank you very much. It's been an honor, Mick. And uh, like I said, guys, go out and see him live. Please get this movie. It's really eye-opening. And it's almost like a Christmas version of Beyond the Mat. Like, it's, it's more uplifting, <laughs> way more uplifting. But it's always a thrill to, to have you and, and, and talk to you. And, and you're just uh, you're giving off the, the Christmas vibe. Yeah, all year around, so. thank you very much, guys. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Including Hanukkah. Hey! Oh, thank you. Yeah. 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 See, you're included. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about that, Dale? I loved it. I mean, that day I was all smiles for the rest of the day. I mean, that yeah. the fact that Mick Foley was sitting here in studio with us, that was like a dream I didn't even know I had right. to fulfill. You know what I'm saying? Like, and we, took, we got a great picture with him. I brought in some, some knickknacks, some Christmas stuff right. for us to wear. I gave him that flask. Yeah, you did. You gave him a flask. <laughs> I am using that as my Christmas card, that photo, by the way. I don't blame you. Yeah. You know what I was going to do for a Christmas card? Um, I was going to borrow like a friend's baby. And just have a picture. This is of already him. weird. It's real weird. Uh, I got a friend friend with a baby. I got a couple. I was gonna have a picture of just me holding a baby, us wearing matching shirts, uh huh, and then saying uh, on top of the card, "This ain't my baby." Merry Christmas on the bottom, and just start sending it. But then I realized I'm way too lazy to even get addresses. So wow. But that's what I really want as my Christmas card. Well, you can make an email version of that. You know. Yeah, you got to show me how. I don't know how to use mail. I don't know how to use MailChimp or anything. Oh, I don't know how to do anything. As a matter of fact, <laughs> you're great at talking, and that's all that counts. Oh man! So Dale, put yourself over, my friend. I am the Walking Dale on Instagram and Twitter. You can also find me cooking up some delish dishes. Yeah, on YouTube.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Slash dishing on movies. We are finishing out our contest on there this week. Uh, I'm giving away some Big Hero Six stuff. We'll be uh, giving that out at the end of this week. So cool. get on there and do your entry if you want in on a piece of that and speaking of contest don't forget go to facebook.com slash wrestling buds and give us your superstar past or present that should have their own app give us the name and what the app does or anything like that that's entertaining make us laugh is what we're trying to say and the winner will get wwe 2k15 uh guys for me at jay quasto um hey my film is just about done go to the thumbwrestler.com you can watch the trailer very proud of it. It's taken me two damn years plus. To yeah, get it out already. God almighty. Lord. I need to get it out. Uh, I'm a pro thumb wrestler at this point. I <laughs> uh, got some stand-up comedy shows coming up, guys. December 11th to the 14th, I'm at the Brea Improv in Cali with uh, the hilarious Roy Wood Jr. I'm a big fan of him. December 17th to the 20th, I'll be at the Denver Comedy Works with my buddy Matt Eisman. He's the host of American Ninja Warrior. So Denver, I know we got listeners in Denver. Come on out to the Comedy Works, y'all. I love Denver. You been out there? It's an amazing city. So and good. this comedy club, I've heard, I've wanted to get into Denver Comedy Works. It's like ridiculously awesome. Nice. Yeah. And then Sunday, December 21st, I'm having my annual Christmas comedy show with my buddy Sean Green. Sunday, December 21st in Bethlehem. Just hit me up on social media if you want to know about it. If you're in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, hell, Connecticut, make the trip. <laughs> Come to the show. Other than that, thank you for listening. If it's your first time, please come back. Subscribe to the show. We guarantee we bring that thunder every single week. Right, Dale? Faux show. All right. That's it. We love you. Have a good week. Now entering... Nerdist.com.